and join with them to really do effective work in our city. I want to start by kind of setting the scene, if you will, in most communities. Um, let's see if that didn't work, did it? There we go. See that? Yeah, okay. This little Venn diagram, I think people have found helpful over time to begin to look at the environment in which we're working. And, uh, and as we think about this, Lance, you, you, they have this PowerPoint as well. They no, will get this PowerPoint yeah. if, if it's shared from uh, Major Morris's office. Yeah, so be it's, it's something that I sent along to Angela. So she has this. Uh, this Venn diagram represents three spheres of influence in our communities. And, and the first uh, area we might call the needs and dreams of our city. And uh, in, in any city or community, leaders have certain dreams for what it can be. And uh, we get at that with our question that we taught in January, which was what? If you, if you were to wake up tomorrow and our community is just as it should be, how does that look in your view? And what, what are the details of that? And then we get at the problems with that question of the needs, that is, by asking, what are the three most pressing problems in our community? Sometimes the needs and the problems are fairly obvious to everyone. But if you really want to get at this, you ask the people who are the leaders of the community, the mayor, the, the county commissioners, the city council, the school board members, the people doing social services in the community. You ask them about that, and they can tell you about some of the, the most important needs in your community. The second, the second sphere represents the mandates and desires of God. And uh, God cares about cities. Cities are mentioned 1,200 times in the Bible. And uh, I studied under Ray Bakke, who was the first one who came up with that quote. He says, the Bible begins in a garden, but it ends in a city. You know? And when, so when you look at God's view on cities, you get a pretty good picture in Revelation 21 and 22, or in Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. God has real hope for cities. And in fact, even when Israel is exiled to Babylon, he gives Jeremiah the word. He says, write them a letter. And Jeremiah writes him a letter, and in that letter he says, seek, and, seek the peace and prosperity of the city, because if it prospers, you too shall prosper. So safety and prosperity is what cities are all about. They're meant for people to prosper. They're not meant for people to be poor and oppressed. But that happens in our cities, doesn't it? God has great desires for our city. And then we have the callings and capacities of the church. And, you know, uh, different churches have different capacities based on their size, and they have different kinds of callings in our communities. Um, but uh, the callings and capacities of the church are a sphere that, that uh, sometimes civic leaders aren't often thinking of. They may think of our churches as constituents, but they may not be thinking about them as having callings and capacities as service organizations in, in the community. Now what's interesting about this Venn diagram is where the intersections are. And the first intersection that we might look at is this area of the intersection between the needs and dreams of our city and the, uh, and the mandates and desires of God. And this area might be known as common grace. Um, when we think about this, we might think back to the Reformation. Calvin, for instance, thought of common grace as, as an example of common grace was the wall around Geneva. He said it keeps the enemies out, it keeps us safe, it gives us a good environment to work in, and it's there for the righteous and the unrighteous alike. And, uh, or, or we might uh, you know, think about some biblical passages. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. So, in, so our cities and communities, they provide common grace. The elements of common grace that we experience might be things like streetlights, 
uh, well-maintained roads, schools, public education available for all the kids, libraries. Uh, elements of common grace may include the public water system. It might include the sewers. It includes all the benefits that all of us enjoy by being a part of that community. A second uh, area that we might look at is the intersection between the church and the needs and dreams of the city. And there's a tendency for, uh, for leaders in the city to look at the, look at the church and want to harness its power and, uh, and begin to get that constituency working for us. There's also the tendency of the church to want the political leaders to do the work of the church. But we say at Good Cities, we put the universal null sign over that, and we say don't go there. It's not helpful for either of you if you try to control the other. The third area of intersection here is between the callings and capacities of the church and the mandates and desires of God. And here, the church is given the unique calling to bring the word of salvation that every person might have the opportunity to be saved. And, uh, and, and it's a unique calling upon the church that God gives the church. But if you'll notice, that intersection doesn't fall within the city because the leaders in the city aren't, they, they want to see common grace for all. They want to see uh, good things happening in terms of education, in terms of the, the services, creating a prosperous economy, all of those good things that the leaders of our city want to see, but they never want to necessarily see the salvation of God come uh, to the city. The church will, in fact, respond if common grace is not issued to all. If there's inequality in that, often the church will, will speak up for the poor and the oppressed to help them in the midst of, uh, of an unequal or unfair situation. But where these three spheres overlap with one another is what we call the sweet spot. And that's service. Because the church is called to serve. If you look at Ephesians chapter 2.10, that we've been created for good works before the foundations of the earth. That's, that's our purpose. When we're, when we're living in the, in the heart of God's grace, we're meant to be serving. And service is welcomed by the leaders of the city. And God is pleased when we serve. In fact, when we talk about service in, in our communities, I've often come to say that this is the opportunity for us to incarnate our faith. And for us to turn that evangelistic question, as I mentioned earlier, on its head, so that people are asking us, who are you and why are you doing this? Service opens the door to many of these things. So um, we've looked at this uh, next diagram. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll go back there for just a oh, while. Well, look at that. You've got to put all these things back in there when you go back one slide. I put this uh, little hold up in the corner, and that is that evangelism is our ultimate motive, but can never be our ulterior motive. When we serve, we've got to be serving of a pure heart, because it's what God calls us to do. But if we do it with an ulterior motive, like we were talking about, there are some ministries that will make the homeless sit through a meal before they give them a, a meal and a night and, and a shelter for the night. Um, so uh, the next slide reminds us that leadership in our community is at least these seven channels of influence. And uh, maybe more than that. But these seven are key in terms of developing our cross-sector relationships. We want, we want to make sure that uh, when we think about serving, that God's people we recognize are in every one of these channels of influence. And so we, we turn to God's people and we turn to others too who might be interested in working with us in our city or community. And uh, there's a lot of people who are interested and we might call those people who are interested in what we do in it, they might form what we call a network where information is shared. There's lots of people interested in hearing about how we serve among the homeless, 
And so they may get a newsletter, or they may, you know, or they may actually participate and volunteer among uh, a homeless ministry. But uh, partnerships are another thing. From the networks that we have, we know of all the people who are serving in literacy, all the people in our community and organizations who are serving among the homeless. We, we begin to know what that network looks like, but not everybody may have uh, enough of a shared mission to begin to become a partner or even interested in becoming a partner. So we have to sort through those carefully. And so this talk is a little bit about how do we sort through uh, the network to get to the point of, uh, of a partnership. You all, have you all had to deal with the difference between networks and partnerships before? Have you thought about that? Because they, you know, everybody who's doing what, you're, what you may be doing may not be on the same page with you as to how you do it or willing to make any compromises to work in a partnership. Partnerships at a whole other level, and it, it involves complexities in human relationships that we might not face otherwise. Now, now, who might we look to to serve in a partnership? Well, to, to understand that, we might look at one more diagram, and that diagram is, uh, is two different kinds of sets. One set we would call a bounded set, and it's represented by a solid line and a circle here. And, and uh, in a bounded set, all the things inside it are similar to one another. You might have all the apples in the world. All the apples are like one another because they're the fruit in an apple, right? Um, well, the church, interestingly enough, in many cases has become a bounded set. Many congregations have membership classes distinguishing themselves from other churches, asking people, do you believe like I believe? in that class and having you confess a certain kind of belief in Jesus Christ, it's different. The Methodists are different than the Presbyterians. The Roman Catholics are different than the Lutherans. The Episcopalians are different than the Anglicans. I mean, there's fine lines sometimes that are drawn between them, but you're in or you're out based on the question of, do you believe like I believe, or do you practice the way we practice in your worship, for instance? On the other hand, we have another kind of set, and that might be known as a centered set. In a centered set, it's represented by a point, and then it doesn't have any boundaries per se. It has porous boundaries if it has any kind, and then it's represented by arrows that either point toward that center or are away from that center. And as individuals, um, we choose to, to uh, affiliate with people in a centered set by, do you, by this question, you know, do you care about what I care about? And uh, that can be true of a company that you work for. You own their mission statement. You try to live it out. You try to sell it to others. You know, or it could be true of, a, of an organization like, let's say you wanted to uh, address the issue of, of, uh, of, uh, of teenage alcohol and chemical abuse adolescent chemical abuse issues. So all the people who care about that would have the vector of their life working toward that center. We want to solve this issue among teenagers. Interestingly, in a, in a, in a uh, centered sex relationship, if you're not with that teenage alcohol and chemical abuse set, your arrow can switch directions. Like, for instance, Let's say my kids are just in elementary school. I'm not thinking about this issue, teenage alcoholism and chemical abuse. I'm trying to get my kid to read, <laughs> you know? But my kid becomes a teenager and gets sucked into the wrong crowd, and now I know she's using marijuana. I know she's out drinking, because I had to pick her up the other night, and she's throwing up. I mean, it is a mess. Guess what, as a parent, my vector has just changed direction. I'm with those folks. I want to figure out how do I get my daughter off these chemicals? How do I get my daughter back to being healthy and joyful again? Her life is a wreck right now. So your arrow can change direction in a set of set. 
This is the way most of our world is, isn't it? The centered set. Only parts of our world are in bounded sets where we're in some kind of club where everybody's like one another, they wear the same funny clothes or they, or they believe the same thing, <coughs> whatever it is. Oh, I'm <laughs> making fun of <laughs> No, no, Ken said that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You've been to Europe. There with your social capital. I know, I know. I was here. I'm thinking about the Masons. Or something, yeah. You know, but, they, but clearly, uh, <laughs> well, when it comes to stages of partnership, uh, we might look at this kind of diagram. And this is something that's in my book, The Good City. I spent a good bit of time on this. When, it, when, when we think about the different stages, I've got three different stages down the left-hand side, exploration, formation, and operation. Each of those requires a, uh, a function and then certain skills to carry those out. And the skills increase as you go down this chart. But the very first one requires vision. When you're exploring, you have to know what is it that I'd like to form a partnership around? What are the results we're looking at? And it doesn't require a partnership for us to do this. And, uh, and, and so I need to be able to tell people the results we're looking for and make it very clear. And at the same time, I need to ask good questions to find out who in my network might have an alignment with this vision and perhaps be a candidate for a possible partnership. After I filtered through a few of those, I may want to get to the point of gaining their commitment in a formation stage. In a formation stage, you want to be careful about the timing that you've developed enough of a relationship with the leader of that other organization uh, and beginning to, to, so you can begin a discussion about whether or not a partnership makes sense. And, uh, and you might do it one-on-one, -on -one, or if there's enough common uh, mission, missional focus, you might do it in a meeting where you have multiple agencies come together. But, but that is something where you really have to be careful of the time and that you don't get someone in there who really doesn't have the trust level to build the, build the partnership. So often